Now remember, Revelation 19, the Lord returns. And it seems as if you read Revelation from about 19 to the end of it, it seems to uh, have, you know, a, an order to it, and that we're going to do chapter 20, where he talks about the millennium, the thousand years. And we looked at the church, it's right here on our chart here, the uh, Brother Tim LaHaye has uh, given to us in his book. Today, I want like us to look at this subject right here, the judgment seat of Christ. And we're talking about here, as he puts it here, it's, this is for rewards. And we've looked at those scriptures that there are going to be definitely rewards. We're going to look at some uh, today in particular. But I want you to think about this time, or the great white throne judgment, uh, which is told about in Revelation 20, where there's certainly going to be some judgment. And it's interesting that the, that the all millennial people, people say it's the same thing. It's all going to be done at the great white throne. That's the one that's mentioned. And whether it's for the Christian and his or her rewards, or the non-Christian for salvation, it's all going to be done there. And the big millennials will say, well, no, if that, we got to have, we got to have it earlier because we're going to be ruling as Christians with Christ during this millennial reign, so we have to have it before. Listen, I don't care when it is, quite frankly. Yeah, I don't, it doesn't make any difference to me who's right on this issue. The point that is for sure, there's going to be judgment. That's the most important thing. So that's what we're looking at today. So for rewards, we're talking about for the Christian, not for heaven or hell. Don't you love this verse? Amen. Read it with me, please. Therefore, there is now no... Can we, can we say that again and emphasize that word? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do we love that? Do we love that? Oh, that just takes all the pressure off as to whether we're in or we're out. Or what about, you know, this uh, time of this? So, uh, we love it because God is holy and we're not. We're going in that direction and the through sanctification, we're becoming a little bit more each, hopefully, year of our lives, what Christ wants us to be. But uh, we don't fool ourselves into thinking that, hey, we've arrived and somehow, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're holy. Because we know we just make too many mistakes and we understand that. But we love that verse here. Judgment is given to Christ. That's one of the scriptures that we see here. That makes this very, very clear. Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing, and the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises from the dead, raises the dead and gives them life, even so, the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. So that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I think that should pretty much settle it right there. When we look at that, that judgment is given to Christ. Here's another one. The Apostle Paul in his sermon on Mars Hill, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge, who is to judge the living and the dead. And by his appearing, obviously this is of Christ, and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Here, Another uh, statement by the Apostle Paul this time, that Jesus is going to judge the living and the dead. The Apostle Peter, in referring to Christ, in all this they are surprised, the unbelievers, that you do not run with them into the same excess of dissipation, and that they malign you, the unbeliever. But, here's the reminder, they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living in the dead. I think that's some, somewhat comforting, especially when an unbeliever really rakes over, you know, a believer. Uh, sure, we need to defend ourselves sometimes, but in the final analysis, they will give an account to the one who's going to judge the living and the dead. We don't need to get back. 
Jesus speaking after telling the parable of the talents. You remember where he gave one five, one two, and one one. And the five brought back how many? Five. And the two brought back two. And the one brought back. He didn't. He didn't say, "Hey, I didn't have done anything with it." And so uh, we know what happened there. The Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him. Then He will sit on His glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So here again is Christ uh, in his role as a judge separating the sheep from the goats, obviously the sheep uh, representing the, uh, the uh, believers in Jesus and the goats, the non-believers. Here's the Apostle Paul on his, in his sermon on Mars Hill. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Great statement. Because he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man <coughs> whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. But the Apostle Paul makes it very clear this Jesus is going to be the judge. He is going to be the one. Come. What does it mean for a judge to recuse himself from the case? The judge feels that he cannot render a fair verdict, so he hands the case over to another person. Right. Thank you very much. That's very good. Tom has done his homework. He happens to be a lawyer, so I figured he, he's, I figured he didn't know that one. Uh, I remember one time I was involved in a, a lawsuit, and my sister and I were, were um, uh, plaintiffs in this, and we were sent up to a particular courtroom uh, for this uh, deliberation. And we walked in, and it happened to be with the defendant was there as well. Well, my sister, as soon as we walked in, began to talk in a very familiar way with the judge. And began to say, oh, hey, how are you doing? And he said, well, how'd your weekend go? You know, and the defendant is looking like, whoa, oh, boy, oh, I don't like this. What did the judge do? He recused himself, and he sent us to another courtroom. And he says, obviously, you know, we're friends. Uh, the defendant in the case breathed a sigh of relief, a sigh of relief like, oh, boy, whoa. Yeah, we don't, I don't have to put up with that. Because we know that wouldn't be a fair decision. Well, let me ask you this. Isn't it great to know that we have a personal, intimate, loving relationship with the person who's going to judge us, who isn't going to recuse himself to judge us? How's that make you feel? You know the judge. If you know Christ, you're in, on an intimate terms with the judge. Now, how's that feel? I'm not so scared going into the courtroom when Christ is a judge. Now, if the devil were the judge, I'd be scared to death. I wouldn't want to go in. They'd have to force me to go in. But when Christ is the judge, hey, I think we're going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to work out. So we need to keep that in mind, you know, that uh, that is who, who is going to uh, judge us. So we are in intimate terms and hopefully becoming more intimate with him, getting to know him better day by day. So uh, we're not scared of this judgment. We Rather, we just look forward to it. Paul to the Corinthians. Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him, for we, we must all, I think this is to everybody, believers and unbelievers, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds, his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. What about your deeds? Things that you do, things that uh, we, we participate in the day here. For by grace, read this one with me, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one may boast. So that no one may boast. Isn't that good? I mean, the truth of that is that we are all the recipients of God's grace. Nobody has earned his or her way into the acceptance of God. Nobody has done that. It's all of grace. It's all uh, simply God just drawing us to himself. Christ dying for us, and we simply have accepted that, what he has done. 
So we're not going to be judged for that as far as uh, our works and far as that, but uh, we want to understand that there is a difference between the rewards for the Christian and just judgment for just everybody. Here's another statement. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Like we're talking about here, the judgment for heaven or hell. We're in, we're going to make it, right? Amen. Right? Amen. Right. Right. I don't know. There's only about 30 of you. I think maybe this is a time for, maybe we should stop and just pray. You know, it could be. This is a time for repentance right here. And it could be seriously for, for anybody, for any of us. Always of grace, but don't forget Jesus' words at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does, is our word again, does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Lord, didn't we do that? Remember? Remember, we were prophesying, preaching. Uh, we were, you know, we were there at the Fellowship Cafe, you know, eating apple pie. And we even cleaned up some of the tables afterwards. Come on, <laughs> don't you remember that? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now that's a sobering statement. And it certainly is one that brings pause to each one of us that, hey, we want to be sure that we are in not just going along with the crowd. It's not just because I'm born into a Christian family or I've been raised in a Christian church or I know somebody who's a Christian. As somebody said, there are no grandchildren in heaven. You get in or you, or you don't get in on your own. You know? So we need to uh, remember that. Let's not be hopefully deceived. You know, the Apostle Paul tells us to test ourselves. The Lord judges. Let a man regard uh, us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required that stu the stewards that one be found trustworthy. In other words, being faithful to what one has uh, control over. But to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. In fact, I do not even examine myself, for I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted, but the one who examines me is the Lord. Now, if you remember here, a lot of times here, he was being criticized for his ministry. This is one of the times where the people that, uh, that he was preaching to were saying, hey, Paul, you know, you're not doing this right, you're not doing that right, and blah, 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 and he's not doing it on him. And he makes this statement, he says, I'm conscious of nothing myself. The one who examines me is the Lord. And my question is, uh, or my statement here, is that sometimes we, people may not agree with us, but we have to say, I'm going to do what I believe God wants me to do. Amen. Have you come to that point in your life that you found out that all Christians may not agree with you? <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take very long, does it? It didn't take very long at all. So sometimes you do have to say, but I'm going to do what, you know, what the Lord wants me to do here. Okay. Paul to the Corinthians and to the Romans. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden. Now think about that statement. I'm going to ask you to talk to your neighbor about that in just a minute. Wait until the Lord comes, who will, bring, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of people's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men, women, people, through Christ Jesus. Think about that. What do you think he means by hidden secrets and motives there? All right. Take a minute. Ask your neighbor. You've got 30 seconds decide what it means to be hidden or secrets or motives. You have 30 seconds. Talk to you, David. <laughs> I've 
Okay, this is just to get you going. Hopefully you'll continue thinking about this later on. But this is just to sort of get your brain going in this direction here. What do you think he means by things hidden or secrets? What did somebody say in your group? What do you think it means by hidden or secret? Javier, got your hand up there. Um, for me, attitude. Attitude, okay. It, very good. Could be You may be doing something that no one can tell, you know, that you have a bad attitude in doing it. Or it could be you had a good attitude in yeah. doing it, yeah. and but no one realized it. No. I think that's has, good. Has to, I don't have to tell Russia or her. I keep it to myself. I don't have to. You, you, you know. try. You could have a good attitude. Yeah. You. No one else can really tell. Maybe people that know you perhaps could. Yeah. But God can, yeah. and He can tell. I like that. The motives. I mean, we can be failing miserably as a Christian, and yet get a reward for it. I believe. I remember. My, I told you about this before, but it it's, it, it haunts me. My first church, I was failing miserably. It was terrible. No matter what I did in church, you had less people every Sunday than had the Sunday before. You know, that's very discouraging for a pastor. Out there, what I did, I, but I tell you, I, did, I believe I'm going to, you know, the Lord's going to judge me not on my words there, but on my motives. My motive was good. The results were horrible. But my motive was good. All right, another one. Hidden or motive? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, with the latter one you said, when, when the people were getting their offerings, Yep. She, and, and, and the Lord commended her and said because she was giving out of her, her, her poverty. She was such a right. gift. She wasn't, they weren't all these big elaborate gifts that right. you know, the other people were giving to get that honor God was the small money because God was into her heart. So the Lord was just right. behind that. Right. Uh, that would be good, one great example. I would say, you know, that thing about hidden, you have to look at that hidden in the darkness. Not just hidden, it's hidden in the darkness. So it's sort of, you know, when you speak of darkness in, in that context, you know, it's sin. Okay. To me, there are things that are hidden in sin, that are cloaked in sin or in injury. That could be. That's all I see. That could be, because uh, Psalm 90, the one written by Moses, he says, forgive us for our secret sins. That's ones that hopefully you don't know about in my life. I'm going to try to keep it a secret as much as possible. You know, now the ones that the, the sins that I know that are in Tom's life, I'm going to ask you all to pray about them. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to list them and ask you to know about them. All right, you got an example here, Darren. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, are you saying that the road to hell is not a good existence? <laughs> what verse is that? Hezekiah, that's Hezekiah 1 2. <laughs> Hezekiah 1 1 is God helps those who help themselves. And Hezekiah 1 2 is God's the, the road to hell. Yeah, that's Hezekiah. But All right, you're saying they're, they're not paying for Yeah. So here we go. Motives. Motives. Secret. Okay, anybody else have some thoughts on this in your group? Uh, Richard? One thing that sometimes I forget is there is no darkness with God. That's right. There's no darkness with God. God sees everything. Mm -hmm. God is omniscient, that big word. He knows everything. There is nothing that escapes his, uh, his knowledge. Very good. Anybody else, any thoughts on this? You had a, a hand? Yes. Uh, oh, they're pointing to Robert. Robert. Robert, they're pointing to you. <laughs> I'm putting my hand up for Molly. Oh, you're pointing it for Molly. And so it's working. That's called oh, passing the back here. Uh, what I was wondering was that uh, all these hidden um, sins and secrets and whatever motives uh, in men's hearts, uh, that, uh, they're, they're going to be judged. Right. And do you think it's going to be, um, I, I've always heard, I've always thought actually, that you're going to be judged and everyone else is going to see what you're going to be judged for. Not well, just it, does, it does think about something about openly. It's, it's going, going to be open up to the world. It does say openly at one point. Yeah. To the, I, I hope it's not our sins that are open. No. <laughs> I hope it's our rewards, not our sins. I'm not sure but, but if, if that's the case. You know. yeah. so that, I, I, from what we even got on this morning, there's no condemnation to those yeah. of us that are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> We're not being judged for our sins, but often I, I, I 
thinking, you know, what have we done with Christ, especially seeing this series on the Bible and seeing the last one, and seeing how, you know, so many of the apostles I mean, gave up their life. And we hear about uh, martyrs around the world, and I think, you know, what does it cost me to be a Christian? Right, right. You know, that, and I think... That's um, what it, you know, I think you know, that that's going to be open. You know, what have, you know, have we, have I been... Um, open to share the gospel every time the opportunity is there. Well, you know, I have it. Sometimes I've backed off, you know. And, and I, you know, I, I just think that it's, you know, for, again, for rewards, what, are, right. what have we done with, with right. Christ? I don't think it would be the sins. If you look up and say that, I think it would be the rewards. You know, and that will be no. But, you know, we have to think about, well, what, what is the reward? I think more than anything, a reward is the recognition by the Lord. I mean, it's, it's not you and I that are, you know, bestowing the reward. It's the Lord. Well, you know that. You know, when, when the Lord gives you something, wow. You know that that's that's important. The recognition by Him to hear, "Well done, you know, good and faithful servant." That's powerful. Mm -hmm. Just because it's the Lord. It's but do you think there'll be different rewards? Yes, for there will be. No question about. We're going to get to that here. There will be different okay. rewards here. All right, motives will be judged. Let's keep going here because I want to get to the end here. Uh, because of your stubbornness, we'll render each to each person according to his deeds, to those who persevere in doing good, eternal life. Those who have selfishly ambitions, they were going to get wrath and judgment, indignation. So we see that. Remember, we're, we're okay here. Look at this example here with Alexander the coppersmith. This is the end of Timothy. As the Apostle Paul is ending his uh, letter, by the way, 2 Timothy, uh, the scholars tell us is the last letter that he wrote. Uh, so it's significant uh, in, in that respect especially. But here at the end of it, uh, he's winding it up and he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. It seemed like, you know, that's not uncommon to have, you know, everybody, or, or practically everybody said, oh, this is wonderful, praise the Lord, this is great, you know, things are going well, and then you get somebody who just is a real pain. Apparently this was Alexander the coppersmith. But notice four things about that. First of all, there is personal responsibility here on the part of the people to prepare for Alexander. Apparently they were in the same church or the same area. So he's telling us, be on guard. And if, you know, you've got to do your part. You know this guy's a troublemaker. So you do your part and be ready. So there's, there's one. We don't just forget about it. We have to do our part. Second thing here is there's no need for vengeance as the Lord will repay him. It's not our responsibility to say, well, you know, this guy or this woman was so bad I am going to be the Lord's instrument for revenge. <laughs> That's not Christian, is it? No. We're not, God, we're not God's instrument for revenge. We need to prepare ourselves. We need to be, you know, wise as, what is it? Wise, wise, wise as a serpent. Wise as a serpent, but gentle as doves. You need to be wise, you know, and not be made a fool out of. But at the same time, if you've done what you can do, we don't have to take vengeance. The Lord will repay that. Uh, that should that should you know comfort us all that you know when we get done dirty, eventually that person's going to answer to the Lord. It's not my place. Here's another thing from it: we can forgive freely. I think that helps us to forgive. Hey, you know, and of course coupled with Colossians where it says, "As the Lord has forgiven you, so also should you forgive others." Now that helps a tremendous amount. Why should I forgive, you know, Daryl for all the, you know, the, the, the things that he's done to me? All his life. All those things, you know. Why? Because Christ has forgiven me. I can forgive even Daryl. Even Daryl. Now I'm just using you as an illustration. James, your father is a fantastic man. You man of God. You know that, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> don't put the nuts cap on there. Okay. The fourth thing. There are degrees, and here we go to Robert's uh, statement here, degrees of rewards and condemnation. We looked at that. There's a scripture for you if you want to look it up and move. 
But there are, and the Bible indicates that there are rewards of condemnation. I mean, whatever hell is, it's not good, but apparently there are rewards, not rewards, but there are degrees of condemnation. And for the Christian, there are degrees of rewards. Uh, so it could be knowing the Lord better, more intimately. Maybe it's capacity. Maybe it's just being recognized more by the Lord. Maybe it's giving more responsibility. Who knows? Whatever it is, it's going to be good. Whatever it is, when the Lord rewards you, it will be good. I'm still hurt in my heart, right here, heart, right here in my heart here when I was 13 years old. And I, I think I told you about this before, but it fits into this, I'll tell you again. I was a breath-holding champion in my, my grammar school. I could hold my breath longer than anybody. <laughs> Can I tell you about that? Underwater. I was a breath underwater. <laughs> underwater. They put me into water. I won every swim meet we ever had with any other school. Not only that, I could swim further underwater than all the real studs, you know, who could really <laughs> swim fast. They had no lungs. They'd go about 15 feet underwater and then pop up. And they were ahead of me, but somehow God just made me with tremendous lungs. And I would just keep underwater and go clear down to the end of the pool, turn around without popping my head up and come clear all the way back and come up to the great ovation of the crowd. So I know, hang on, I knew every time I was going to get the blue ribbon for breath holding and the blue ribbon for uh, swimming underwater the furthest. And at the end of the meet, they gave out the, the ribbons. And they gave me the one for swimming the furthest underwater. Everybody applauded me, and I loved that, because here was all my friends who were really athletes. You know, they were going swimming fast, and uh, they were doing flips off the board, and all I could do is hold my breath. And so they went through everybody else, and they dismissed the track, the swim meet, and I said, what, 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 what about my other, what about my other blue ribbon? I couldn't believe it. They sent everybody away, and I hadn't got my second ribbon. I mean, I was hurt still. I'm still hurt about that. <laughs> and I went up to the, to the teacher, Mr. Otto. I remember his name, Mr. Otto. His face just bugs me right now. <laughs> I said, Mr. Otto, I didn't get the ribbon, you know, for holding my breath the longest. He said, oh, you didn't. Oh, here. Come on, where's the honor to that? Dog gone. <laughs> still hurt about that. And the Lord repay him. No, no, no. <laughs> The point is, reward, a big part of it, is who gives it, and the recognition. And the Lord's going to take care of that. All right, we've got to keep going here, so let me go a little bit further. Be careful how that person builds. He said, I laid a foundation. No man can lay a foundation other than the one who is, which is laid is, is Jesus Christ. What's the foundation of the church? We know that's Christ. And he tells us here in 1 Corinthians 3, there are two ways to build. Gold, silver, precious stones, we're talking about a building, or we can build with wood, hay, and straw. Each man's, evident will be, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show itself, because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. So we're talking about the superstructure of this building. We know the foundation. We know that. We know we must build. There are two ways to build <clears throat> superstructure. One is gold, silver, precious stones. An emblem of what? Symbols of what? Which is it? Quality. Symbols of what? Give us another word. Strength. Strength. Give us another word. Perfection. Perfection. Give us another word. Cost. Cost. Sacrifice. Give us some more here. What if you build up your, your life, your Christian life, with wood, hay, or straw? What does that represent? Perishable. <clears throat> Perishable. Perishable. Yeah, that type of thing. What else? Give me another word. What is it? Temporary. Temporary. Okay. <laughs> Quickly. Utility. I always had a friend when he would ever did something around the house, he was fixing something for his wife, and he got kind of the end of it, he got tired of it. He, he, please don't be offended. He'd always say, well, it's, it's close enough for government to work. <laughs> now, I don't know, any, anybody work for the government? I can't be too bad about that because I'm on Social Security, so I've got to be careful here about that. But, uh, you know, we, uh, there's, there's, you know, when you build, you've got to build something, 
you, you can build something maybe like this, you know, like, like that. Uh, but let me ask you that question. Is this ready for the fire? Is it going to stand the fire? No way. I don't think so. Uh, my, my mother, when she came, she came uh, a follower of Christ, she was older in life. She only had a few years before she, she died and went to heaven. And uh, she always said, well, you know, I think I'll probably end up cleaning the toilets because I really haven't done much with the Lord. <laughs> I don't know. But it's an honor if that's what the Lord wants you to do. You know, it's an honor there. I had a friend in seminary. And of course, in seminary, you know, they give you all kinds of what they call collateral reading. You know, they don't think anything giving you 500 pages to read. And uh, one preacher was so honest enough to say, you know, I set the world speed reading record on a lot of that collateral reading. You know, he said, I could read so, I could just look at the page. You know, that sounds good to me. I had another friend who put it this way. He said, I think a lot of my collateral reading will just go up in a puff of smoke. And I thought, well, that's one way to put it. Well, let me ask you, is this ready for the fire? Or what about this? What about this? You know, on this house here, uh, by the way, this is our house. In case you know. <laughs> I want to tell you, I want to tell you, we are fully fire prepared. We have uh, we have uh, the sprinkler system throughout the house. Uh, we're ready for fire. We're ready for earthquake. Now you just look at this. There's two ways to build the Christian life. One is to do it carefully, maybe slowly, but to do it strongly, and to do it the way Christ wants us to. Remember, he's going to be the one we answer to. He's our judge. But we want to, if it's for Christ, how do we want that? How do we want to present that? You know, if you're doing stuff for me, you know, thank you. We appreciate it. But remember, Christ made it very clear when they said, well, how do we know that we've done it to you, Christ? And he said, well, you've done it to one of these. But we serve others should be with an attitude, I'm serving Christ. I know we have that here because every week we have people come down and, and fix all this, this wonderful, uh, you know, tables and everything. Every week people come down and do that. Every week people come down and teach Sunday school. Every week we have people, you know, that attitude and the reason to do that, the motive is so important. So my question is, which way are you building your Christian life? You're doing it in a hurry, like, okay, or you're doing it carefully, methodically, prayerfully, and I'm going to build something, you know, that I will be proud to give to the Lord. Lord, it's at this time that we look at that, and Lord, we want to, we just want to review these statements that you've made to us through the scriptures. Lord, it's for you. And we think, just as we've seen in the last few weeks, that presentation of the Bible and uh, to be reminded in in movie in this movie the sacrifice that you made for us that you actually gave your life here with no sin to your account at all and we with our, our rebellion and our sin and Lord you gave yourself now Lord we just we just come to you and we we just bow down to you and Lord thank you that you've given us an opportunity after we have learned who you are and make you our Lord be able to serve you, to be able to have some time, whether it's a few years or many years, but some time, Lord, in which to give honor to you with everything that we do in our families, in our relationship with our husband, with our wives, with our children, grandchildren, relatives, in our relationship with our people at church, our friends at church, in our relationship with the people at work. You've given us an opportunity, Lord, to honor you in each of these. May we be reminded, Lord, that we want to build with gold and silver and precious stones. Oh, Lord, help each one of us to build in a careful way so that when on Judgment Day, when we come into your presence, Lord, you'll be able to say, well done, you good and faithful servant. Oh, Lord, that's our desire. Lord, we just want to commit ourselves None of us has been perfect in our lives. We look back and we see things that we haven't done, that we should have done. And Lord, as we look at our motives, Lord, just purify. And Lord, if we have not had the right motives or acts, God, forgive us. We just repent and make it evident and make it plain to you. We have done wrong. 
We haven't had the motives that we should. We haven't done the things that we should have done. Lord, take our lives and revive us, revitalize us, inspire us, Lord. Give us revival in our own hearts. Lord, give us revival in our own church. Give us revival, Lord, for you. That we may be able to live and to uh, live and give testimony to the wonderful grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Okay, Greg, are we ready here? Oh, Greg is our CT step. How many know CT step? step? All right, there's one on CT stud. All right. All right, well, there's CT stud. He's a cricketer. He's a cricketer. You know what a cricketer is? That's an English baseball player. They don't know how to play baseball, so they play cricket over there. And they bat things back and forth like that. Well, he was, a, he was born in England in 1860. His father was wealthy, Edward Stud. And uh, his father became a Christian under the ministry of D.L. Moody a great evangelist in a preaching tour in England. Well, C.T., the son, he became a Christian as a high school youth when a visiting preacher visited their home and pushed for a decision for Christ by C.T. He resisted the urging of the preacher, but finally I got down on my knees and I did say thank you to God. And, then, and right then and there, joy and peace came into my soul. I knew then what it was to be born again. And the Bible, which had been so dry to me before, became everything. He graduated from Trinity College, and when he was 23 years old, his brother became seriously ill, and C.T. asked himself, what is all the fame and flattery worth when a man comes to face eternity? He humbly admitted that since his conversion some years, six years later, earlier, he had been in an unhappy, backslidden state. As a result of this, he said, I know that cricket would not last, cricket would not last, and honor would not last, and nothing in this world would last, but it was worthwhile living for the world to come. C.T. became a missionary under Hudson Taylor, and he served in China, where it was here that his father died, and C.T. gave all his inheritance away to Christian causes, causes including my, Moody, Moody Bible Institute and George Miller's orphanage work. He eventually married, and they had four daughters and two sons who died in infancy. Throughout his ministry, he emphasized the future life and how important that is, and he emphasized that all Christians should be doing missionary work here. He made the statement, some want to live within the sound of the church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue ship within a yard of hell. C.T. did missionary work in China, Africa, and India, and was laboring hard for the Lord when he died in 1931 at the age of 70. He died as a mere youth from untreated gallstone. He left behind this very powerful poem where two lines of it are very well known. Two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart, say it with me, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Say it with me. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice. Bidding me selfish aims to leave, and to God's holy will to cleave. Say it with me. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears, each with its plays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. But this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score. When self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me a father, a purpose deep, in joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whate'er the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be 
be past, only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let me love with fervor fur, fur, burn, and from the world now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be past, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life? Yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, twas worth it all. Only one life will soon be past, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life will soon be past, only what's done for Christ will last. And when I am dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Lord, may we remember that life is so brief. And the older we get, the more we understand and realize, Lord, it goes so quickly. It seems like just 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40, 50, 60 years ago, and it just, in a flash, it's gone. Every day is precious. Every day is yours. May we give it to you. We pray this in Christ's name. All right, now we're ready, Greg. <laughs> 